I want to first of all thank well you all for coming and thank also uh, our funders. Uh, this would not have been possible uh, but for the generosity of uh, Harsini Panditaratne, uh, Oldsburg University class in 2001, who has committed herself to uh, giving back to Oldsburg at least what she received in scholarship money and let that be a model for all of you. Uh, I'm hoping she, we can talk her into being even more generous than that, but I'm quite happy to have uh, the, the gift she's offered us so far, uh, one of which enabled me uh, to uh, go to two other funders and uh, say you can uh, get more bang for your buck because I've already got some money from an alum. And the two other funders are the Charles Koch Foundation and the Institute for Humane Studies, both of whom have uh, been very generous uh, this year uh, supporting this and in the case of the Institute for Humane Studies also the Constitution Day lecture in the fall. Uh, we're very fortunate to have with us here uh, Mr. Henry Olson who uh, I never met until a few hours ago. Uh, I've admired him from afar for quite some time. Uh, he was one of my uh, very few kind of go-to people for understanding uh, contemporary political life. Uh, he writes very incisively about contemporary politics, about uh, partisan alignment, realignment, dealignment, and, and so on. Now I want to tell you a little bit about him. Uh, you, can, you can find his work on the pages of the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, uh, National Review, uh, uh, a website uh, called American Greatness. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about him. We've had uh, four people with, uh, who have spent some time in the academy speaking here. And, uh, Mr. Olson comes to us more from the, the political and think tank world. Uh, he was. Uh, at one time, let's see if I've got this right, uh, Vice President and Director of the National Research Initiative at the American Enterprise Institute, which is one of the, 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 the two great conservative, at least two great conservative think tanks in Washington, D.C. He was uh, Vice President for Programs at the Hudson Institute, another great uh, think tank. Excuse me? Manhattan. Oh, Manhattan Institute. Oh, got that one wrong. I'm sorry. No, President of the, 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 the Commonwealth Foundation. Uh, he worked before that as a, a political consultant and uh, aide in the California uh, General Assembly. Uh, his bachelor's degree is from Claremont McKenna College, great liberal arts college in uh, California. His uh, law degree is from the University of Chicago Law School, a, a great law school, of course, in Chicago. Uh, and uh, if you're a lawyer, this will mean an awful lot to you. He, uh, was a clerk for uh, Danny J. Boggs of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. That tells anyone who pays attention to these things that he was an extremely good law student. Uh, so without further ado, I give you Henry Olson. Thank you very much. Well, you've been hearing a lot about community. And I think my talk is going to be about how communities can collapse, how communities can collapse into internecine conflict and how in fact our community, the American community, may be involved in uh, such a determination as to whether we're going to go down that path or whether we're going to renew ourselves in a way that permits continued fellowship and citizenship. Uh, the Chinese are said to have an, a, a blessing and a curse in one sentence, may you live in interesting times. And I think anyone who wakes up in the morning with a Twitter feed knows that that's true, both in terms of the blessing, depending on your viewpoint of the president, or the curse, depending on the viewpoint of the president. But in a sense, there, what's going on right now is the culmination of forces uh, and ideas that have been brewing for quite some time. Uh, and they are ideas that get to the heart of what it means to be an American, about how we live and how we relate to one another. And they have grown to the point where in their sure, purest and simple form, my hypothesis is that they are incompatible with one another. And what we know from political science is that when two peoples who share a common territory have incompatible beliefs about how to live, that leads to one of three, one of, uh, three things. It leads to war, it leads to separation, or it leads to redefinition. And I'd like to go through each of those options with you and try and show how what we're happening in America today in fact, fits into that tripartite 
uh, first it fits into the uh, rather apocalyptic uh, analysis, and second, that the alternatives fit exactly into that tripartite uh, formula that we would get from a purely historical view of political science. Um, but with respect <coughs> to uh, the, the diagnosis, consider some of what we know to be true. Consider our extreme partisanship. Now, most of the people I can tell by looking at you uh, um, are under the age of 25. So this is kind of the world that you've grown up in, cable television and Twitter and social media or people hurled uh, instant, uh, attacks at one another that you're part of team red or team blue and there's not much in between kind of back in the days when um, um, Twilight was popular. You're either on Team Edward or Team Jacob. You couldn't marry both of them. You had to be on one team. Uh, this is not normal politics. Partisanship is normal. Preference is normal. But that degree of selection, that degree of inability to overlap is not normal in America. Consider some findings from the Pew Research Center from uh, just last year that they asked American uh, people, uh, do you believe that the viewpoints of the other party are mostly generally okay or right? Are they generally wrong, but they uh, um, something that we can live with, or is it, are they so wrong that they pose a threat to the country? Majorities of both Democrats and Republicans chose that latter view, that the other party views are so wrong that they pose a threat to the country. That's not normal. That's not what polls were showing in the 1950s, when you also had Team Red and Team Blue fighting in normal elections. Consider residential sorting. There's a lot of evidence that shows that people are increasingly choosing to live in neighborhoods that mirror their own values. That if you are conservative, you will find a place, whether it's a city or a town or a neighborhood within a larger area, where the people look like you, sound like you, and think like you. And that the same is true if you're a person of color or if you're a person of the left, that you will live in areas that think, sound, and look just like you. When you can't be together because you can't live together, that's a problem for a nation that requires you to do both. Third, consider the nature of the political disagreements. Again, it's always been a nature of politics to call the other side liars and rogues. It has not been a nature of American politics to constantly have recourse to the courts or criminal action that criminalize political dispute or threaten to criminalize political dispute. Lock her up or he's in collusion with the Russians, throw him in jail, are not normal political slogans. These happen in times of great discord, great disagreement, and that means great questions arise before us. <coughs> Now, this isn't the first time this has happened in history. Uh, obviously not, as from what I've said suggests. Unfortunately, some of those examples that we can turn to are not terribly optimistic. Religious wars in the medieval times, or the late medieval era and the early modern times, are an example that was well known to the American founders, where the question of the salvation of your soul based on the question of your orthodoxy was a primary political question throughout the nations of Europe, whether you were Catholic, or whether you were Calvinist, or whether you were Lutheran, was something that animated people to the degree that wars were fought both within and between nations, and proscriptions and hangings and of the sort were the case in both Protestant and Catholic countries. It was only through the exhaustion of an entire continent by the end of the 17th century that they finally reached a modus vivendi and ended the civil conflict. World War II was of this sort. That again, this is less a question within a country, but a question between countries where it's simply incompatible to live in a liberal democracy or to live in a fascist state, whether that fascism was the relatively benign fascism of Italy's Mussolini or the particular heinous and evil fascism of National Socialism in Germany. That fascism presented itself as an alternative and a superior way of life to the liberal democrat, first conquering <coughs> that viewpoint in the countries of their origin, and then waging aggressive war on the other liberal democracies in order to spread that vision. We know what World War II resulted in. The Cold War, fortunately, did not end with a global military conflict, but was a 50-year conflict, again, between two incompatible ways of life. There could be shades of communism, but one could not be communist and have a liberal, de be a liberal democracy. There could be shades of liberal democracy, as anyone that could travel from Sweden to the United States could discover. 
but one could not be a liberal democrat, and one could not be communist. One side triumphed in each of these. As Lincoln said, a house divided itself cannot stand. It must become all one thing or all the other. That is the question that presents to us today. So the question is, what are these two sides genuinely fighting over? Previous normal politics is, as Madison intended, in a commercial extended republic, questions about the distribution and the production of goods. These are the sorts that neither excite men's souls nor are incapable of compromise. Tax rates can be split. Uh, decisions of, of regulation can be uh, adjusted to the rule of reason. Whether one lives in a particular manner or lives in a, uh, or not is not capable of division, at least as purely understood. So the way I'm going to define the question that's dividing us is this. There are other ways to do it, but for the purposes of our discussion, I'm going to adopt this. Are we a nation? Is America a nation of individuals whose relation to one another is contractual and consensual? And that nature, that political expression, is bounded only by a prohibition on, the den on, uh, on denying the very foundation of the order? Or are we a nation grounded in a specific set of beliefs whose perpetuation and protection demand precedence over other competing definitions of nation? If the second view prevails in its simple and pure form, then those who disagree with that will feel themselves oppressed. If the first view prevails, those who disagree will feel both dispossessed and oppressed, since the people who share the second view believe themselves, and in many cases lineally are, uh, of longer standing uh, residents within this country. Unless, my thesis is, unless we either arrive at a sort of modus, modus vivendi that ended the religious wars, a sort of live and let live approach that splits the difference by giving each a measure of public authority over a piece of territory that they can call their own. Or we come with a new renewal of an American understanding, American nationality, American citizenship that's based on a reinterpretation of the idea that founded America, the idea that all men are created equal then we are doomed to follow one of the other two unfortunate courses. We are doomed to either conflict or separation. So let's go through uh, each of these things. I'd like to first show you that my characterization is correct. Uh, I'd then like to walk through what it would look like if either side of the simple view were to prevail without such either a modus vivendi or some sort of reinterpretation. And then I'd like to go through what a more positive solution to this conflict could be and describe what I think uh, one of the two positive solutions could be that would allow us to redefine America in a way that allow us to live with one another and not simply live in separate armed camps. Is it not, uh, I run something called the Voter Study Group. And what we do is we have the, simply the largest survey of any type in America that is also known as a panel survey. Uh, normally in a survey, you interview new people each time, so you're assuming that the people that you are interviewing have similar backgrounds to the people who you interviewed before, but you cannot actually say that uh, you're making an inference. You cannot actually say that person X has changed their mind or person Y believes such. You're made using st laws of statistics and probability to draw similarity between your two surveys. Our survey is a panel survey, which means that we're actually interviewing these same people. And we've been doing that over a number of seven years. We are the only survey that I'm aware of that does that. And our most recent work has shown that, in fact, we can demonstrate that the two views that I set out and characterized are, in fact, shared by the two major political parties and, in fact, partially explain the people who moved away from their political parties in the 2016 election, which is say that Republicans who voted for Hillary Clinton tend to agree with Democrats on the definition of nationality that I outweigh as option number one. And people who agree, voted for Trump, who had formerly been Democrats, tended to agree with Republicans on the definition of nationality that I had set up as, op, uh, as option two. Our surveys show that Democrats believe in what they would call an open society, and by open they mean tolerant of all, who do not necessarily share any connection of lineage or residence or uh, nationality, uh, with prior residents of the United States. 
It is not founded in an idea of limited government as traditionally understood by the founders of the Constitution. It is rather uh, based on an idea of evolving standards uh, and uh, prudential determinations that are much more in line with a parliamentary democracy than a constitutional democracy of our sort. Nor is it founded in any way by a sense of Christianity, whether traditionally or modernly uh, interpreted. This is a state that by and large they view as being superior to religion and not necessarily dependent upon religion. Uh, it is a coalition that contains many believing Christians but does not define its existence, nor does it define America on the adoption or the particular um, respect for those views. This is a coalition um, that uh, it is for these reasons that immigration and trade are of particular interest because trade represents an openness to the other nations of the world that allows the balance of contract to extend itself to other places. And immigration allows people from the other parts of the world to become new members of the American society and become new members to whom contractual obligations are extended. The contract is not simply a libertarian contract, though. It's a social democratic contract. It's one that includes a significant regulation of private property, significant redistribution of wealth, and significant taxation to provide public services. This is something that's believed to be an essential part of the American contract and is a non-negotiable part of that contract. The Republican view is different. The Republican view is that America is a nation. It's not a nation in the way that Europe European countries are nation states. Most European countries, not all, are what we would call nation states. And the idea of the nation state is something that we have adopted as our own terminology so, so, for so long that we tend to forget that it was a modern creation. The idea was that the nation, the collection of a people bound together by ethnicity and blood, ought to have a political entity, a state that is coextensive with the territory in which that population dominates. It's on that basis that many warring Italian states came together under the idea of an Italian nation, the, those who spoke Italian, uh, and in 1861, a state comprising most of Italy was formed, and it was not considered complete until finally all areas that spoke Italian uh, were united within it. And that did not happen until after the end of the First World War. Similarly, Polish nationality, which became important in the 19th century is defined exactly on the idea that there's a Polish nation, and it's not until there's a state that comprises the Polish nation that the Polish people can be genuinely free. The American national identity is advanced by Republicans is one that's on, the idea, uh, on ideas. And it's particularly, depending on the strain of Republican, either founded in limited government or in Christianity or in some admixture of the two. Many conservatives actually have a foot in both camps. Uh, but consequently, what it means is that uh, the perpetuation and the protection of those founding beliefs is considered to be of utmost importance. And that it doesn't mean that there should be some sort of dogma or theocratic uh, state established, but rather that uh, the, the, the norms of a Christian religion, uh, rather than the theological doctrines of a Christian religion, are essential to the operation of the American state. And the limitation of the power of government to interfere in private contractual relations and private lives, except where Christian morality dictates such, is something that is also crucial to the Republican. Consequently, immigration and trade are important to Republicans for precisely the opposite reasons, because the idea is that the, uh, since uh, you must ensure that people have some degree of fidelity to or understanding of these principles before they become citizens, it's the obligation of the nation to regulate immigration to the point uh, that we can assure ourselves that those beliefs will be propagated and, uh, and continue. Uh, this is also a belief uh, that uh, re uh, can be self-described in some way as reformist liberalism, except in some strains it's not opposed to the modern state's redistributive impulses, but it believes that they should be limited and reduced to the smallest degree necessary. The na this is, I believe, and our data suggests, is the actual nature of the conflict of Trump and his critics. That everything else is a window dressing, everything else is a weapon to be wielded by people who hold one or both of these beliefs. It's why the person who wrote the Flight 93 election, a uh, famous essay from 2016, could write that. Because the very essence of American nationality 
was at stake. And it's why I believe you look at the resist cause with the people who believe in that, believe that if Trump prevails, if he's reelected, the very essence of how they define themselves as American is violated and repressed. This is what, in both cases, uh, Madison would have called uh, excessive zeal. If one reads the Federalist Papers, one discovers that part of the reason he adopted and, proposed and justified the separation of powers and federalism and the checks and balances uh, that were contained in the Constitution was to ensure that we would never have a political division where we were in one camp or the other motivated by zealotry. That was what he believed was the problem of the religious wars, so that by extending the territory of the republic and by confining the nature of political disputes to commercial ones, you would have too many interests for them to combine into parties of one versus the other. The manufacturing interest is different from the seafaring interest, which is different from the labor interest. And would also, you would find that people who are taught, people rarely die about money, they die about justice. So you, through his means, would um, ensure that zeal was not part of politics. But of course, we're seeing that zeal has re-entered itself. How can it end badly? Well, we have the Civil War as an example of how it ended badly. Because that's exactly what the question that happened during the Civil War was. It became a question of utmost importance, whether slavery not only was limited, but whether it was all morally wrong and inconsistent with the American way of life. The slaveholders not only wanted to expand slavery, but wanted to insist on a positive declaration of slavery's inherent justice. It was for that reason why they split the Democratic Party in 1860. Because even though they knew that they could not win in the North with such a declaration, they would not support a candidate, Stephen Douglas of Illinois, who wanted to, could not make that declaration. They had to have a positive declaration of the justice of slavery in order to continue the moral conflict that was dividing the country. Um, I don't think we will have a civil war but here's how I think it would end very badly if one side won in their, un, in their simple, unmitigated uh, position. Let's assume a Republican victory for the moment. Uh, a Republican victory would be particularly problematic for a couple of reasons. First, because it would largely rest on the geographic concentration of its adherents. Uh, Donald Trump lost the popular vote. Republicans are likely to lose the popular vote, whether or not they hold the House. And that's because of the simple fact, as I mentioned before, of residential segregation. Democrats, in, just as Republicans increasingly live by, with themselves, Democrats increasingly live with themselves, and that means that huge majorities come out of a small number of states. But they're not sufficient under our federal system to command national majorities, which means that you can win election after election with a minority of the vote. That is what a Republican victory in its simplest form would require. And then what would happen in the case? Imagine a world where Donald Trump and Republicans hold the House and the Senate this time, and they win re-election in, in 2020, and then they uh, hold and win re-election in 2024. Eight years of continuing popular majorities on one side, eight years because of our constitutionally sanctioned federal election process where the minority rule. What would be the consequence of that well, if we take them at their, at their uh, face uh, every single one of the core tenets of the progressive view of American identity would be whittled away or would be removed. Imagine a California that has to deal with a 7-2 Supreme Court for whom Roe versus Wade is something that is waiting to be repealed and for whom same-sex marriage is, uh, in the Obergefell decision, is simply a precedent of recent, uh, that of recent incidents and consequently of little presidential value. Would those states want to remain part of a union of that nature? Would, it probably, would residents of the San Francisco Bay Area want to be ruled by Alabamans? Uh, one suspects not. One suspects in that case that some of the calls for the splitting of California or the secession of California might occur. One might also want to recourse to something that Hillary Clinton said in her widely derided tour of the last month where she said that she was the uh, choice of the economically vibrant regions. The fact is that's true, that the areas that supported Hillary Clinton are almost uh, 
or either supported her or moved towards her in the election were almost all of the major metropolitan areas, and the states that she carried have a minority of the population but a majority of the GDP, and it's growing. The Pacific states and the Atlantic states are contiguous, they are populous, they are wealthy, and they are larger than most of the countries of the world. It would not be something that a Pacifica, and it would not be fantastical that a Pacifica and Atlantica, a Pacific states of America and Atlantic states of America could be vibrant economically. Now that is a dystopian scenario, but it is an impossible scenario. Can you imagine your friends in California who have lost their fifth consecutive election chanting resist, now going along and saying submit, or might they consider another option? The democratic scenario is dystopian in another way, which is say that that requires a national unity of national identity. It is a hallmark of progressive domestic policy that not only are values to be enshrined as a uh, key to national identity, but there can be no local dissent from that. That's what the Obergefell decision was about. It was not about live and let live, of uh, saying that one could recognize same-sex marriage. It was rather saying that there, even if you do not have a majority of people, you cannot use your democratic means in order to assert some degree of value expression over your territory. What that means is that a democratic victory would necessarily move towards a nationalization of the values of American life. It would be something that would increasingly come into conflict in, with people's opinions in those regions that do not hold a majority. This would be the case of the flip side of the dystopian scenario I just outlined. This would be a case where New Yorkers and Angelinos would be telling Alabamans how to live their lives. This would be one where one would see the temptations to use definitions of hate speech and microaggression, not simply to cover extreme examples, but rather central elements of the way uh, particularly Bible-believing Christians uh, believe they ought to live their lives, and denying the public expression or the public enactment of those values through the systems of representative government in those states. This cannot end well, particularly in a hyper-armed nation like the United States. So I'd like to close by being optimistic. I'd like to close by recalling us to the better angels of our nature and saying we have yet time to step back from the brink. We have yet time to rediscover and reanimate the purpose of American nationality. I spoke of a modus vivendi that solved the religious wars. It simply consisted of one of two things. One, it started with the, uh, with the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 that said that Catholic states would no longer seek to war against Protestant states and vice versa, that the religion of the ruler would be, if necessary, the religion of the people. This is not a core religious liberty within states, but it courted religious liberty between states. Neither would interfere with the people and the rulers in the countries where they were not already exit. The American version of that would be federalism, which is to say, saying that we are, such, so, we are in such violent disagreement on these things, questions of how to live, that we'll start to permit what we had before the 20th century, which was a greater variety of ways of life and laws governing culture and wars between the states. It would be one where one could imagine a world where Alabama would have abortion outlawed and California would allow it for a, at a publicly financed basis for the remainder of, of the term of pregnancy. It would be one where there would be other significant disagreements. It would not be one that would make everybody or even most people happy, but it would be one that would keep the peace. It's essentially what the Swiss did when they dealt with their own divisions, that there was a civil war in 1848 between Catholic cantons and Protestant cantons called the Sonderbund Treaty, uh, which was settled by establishing the, uh, the confederation that I have now, which is essentially one of live and let live at the cantonal, which is their version of the state level. The other thing that was adopted was an idea of religious liberty, the idea that one could dissent from the views within a particular state with freedom to your person and your property. That evolved later than the idea of live and let live. It was something which uh, did not pertain in the United States when during the colonial period. It's something that Thomas Jefferson fought for in Virginia and was so proud of. It's one of the three things that he inscribed on his tombstone the author of the Virginia Statute of Religious Liberty. 
Adopting that viewpoint would mean that one could be a dissenter within a particular state and not face any prescription. It's certainly one that is enshrined in our Constitution, and the reaffirmation of that is something that would be essential to a live and elaborate solution to this. But I'd like to talk and, and with looking at another option, because Americans do live in a federal, in a national system as much uh, it's a return to federalism might be considered a uh, second best or a third best solution, but certainly not a preferred best solution. Since at least the Civil, since the civil War, or at least since the uh, revolution in American understanding that was wrought during the New Deal, which significantly nationalized political life, we have had a much stronger national identity than we've had a regional, local, or state-based identity. We would need to think of a new national identity that allows all sides in this conflict to have value and self-affirmation, that would allow them to see themselves and their values as having respect in American narrative. It is harder to imagine this than it is to imagine the dystopian scenarios, except to the degree that it's something that I think most Americans want. I think when one talks about America as a land of liberty and freedom of opportunity, these are shared values. I think when we talk about pride in America, uh, I think most people either have strong pride in America or have a pride of an America that can learn to redeem itself and recall itself to its better nature. I think an American statesmanship that is geared towards this is an American statesmanship that can go beyond red and blue. It's an American statesmanship that perhaps cannot take form within the two existing political parties, but much as in France, where the traditional right versus left that has dominated French politics for 150 years has been upended and destroyed by a new centrist party that elected a majority of their assembly last year, which elected the president of France, taking people from left, right, and center who did not want to go along with the old left-right division, but rather thought that a new France required a new political party in order to create a new and positive future. I think there is a plurality, perhaps even a majority of Americans, the 40-some percent of Democrats and Republicans, who disagrees with the other party, but don't think that they're a threat to the other, to the nation. The independents who see uh, both a pox in both houses and promise in both houses. I think this political entity, called together under a new definition of Americanism, is one that could offer us not only a positive solution in the sense of avoiding conflict or avoiding separation, but rather a new America that can allow us to enter confidently into challenges that will last for decades. The challenges of automation, the challenge of globalization, the challenges of increasing education and wealth that the current political structure seems incapable of dealing with. My hope is that we can recall ourselves, that we can take this course and move to a better America because the alternatives are simply too dire to even seriously contemplate and, the, uh, and they're too dire for serious American patriots to be willing to uh, tolerate. Thank you. Well, let me, let me start. Yeah, go for uh, it. You described a, a kind of residential and ideological sort of. Mm -hmm. And in those uh, constituency-based elections, we have winner-take-all elections. It right. tends to favor uh, the extremes of the right and the left. Because of the primary system. Yes. Right. So you offer this glimmer of hope at the end. How could that glimmer of hope arise practically from a political system that is organized the, uh, geographically and constituency based with primary elections the way uh, ours currently is. It can only arise through one of two means. It can arise through a party that uh, is uh, open to uh, taking the dissenters from another party uh, and then you would have a majority within the party. For example, if some of those 40% of Republicans who don't think the Democrats or the second coming of Satan were suddenly to start voting in Democratic primaries, they're similarly like-minded. People would now have both a majority within their primaries, and then they would have a majority within the country. The other way of doing it is for the two centers to combine into a new party, because um, what you would then have is uh, effectively what the Republican Party was, which is building on an old party but bringing in disaffected Democrats to create a new party 
that was able to win regional based elections with pluralities in front of them. And that's why uh, that's how Macron did it. Uh, although they had a slightly different system that makes it easier for them to do it. If you were to have a new party that were founded by dissidents of both sides that consciously tried to also incorporate independents who were dissatisfied with the increasing he said, she said, left bad, right bad uh, politics, um, pluralities can win. Uh, plurality, and we just saw this in Hungary where the ruling party won 90% um, of the geographically based single district seats in many cases with pluralities of the vote because the um, uh, opposition was divided. That's exactly what you would have here. The poll of the Democrats on the left and the poll of the Republicans on the right could never agree uh, to be a plurality of the center. Mm -hmm. So, can you sort of hark back to this idea of Madisonian democracy, and why is that so necessary in a modern context? Um, sort of, Madison was, you know, a, a bit before our time. Why is this something that we should be considering as something we should do now, being as, if we kind of consider it, we're a natural progression of those ideas forward. Why must we go back to a sort of pre-existing system when we've already come, some might say, so far to this system. Well, what, what I wanted to cite with Madison was his description of the, of the ill, that, um, that in order to preserve civil peace, um, he believed that we should try and defer debates about identity, to use you know, a phrase that he would never have used, but a word that we would use today. The question is, is he right? Um, if he is right, then, I'm not necessarily saying that we should use his forms, but rather that we should readapt new, you know, that we should try and combat this. Uh, but if he's wrong, then what we're effect if you believe he's wrong, then effectively what you're doing is taking a side in one of the two disputes. You're saying this is essential, this cannot be deferred, and we must have this political discussion and one side must win. And all I'm trying to do is say these debates formed in that way usually do not end nicely. They do not end with one side losing a couple of elections and then becoming Me Too parties, you know, which is kind of like after Reagan won two elections, Democrats wanted to say they're new Democrats and I've got a tax cut. And that's what, uh, why we got the tax reform of 1986. These type of debates can, uh, tend to end in separation or war or tyranny. And that's why I believe it would be very wise for us to try and step back from this precipice because once the passions are on these, they're very hard to contain within normal democratic politics. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then I see you over here right here. So you mentioned... Um, I'm sorry, I have... Can you speak up? You mentioned about like your solution was to become like, an independent sort of party. Why do you think that Bernie Sanders failed? Because he was sort of culminating both the left and the right. That who failed? Bernie Sanders, the right, because he did support gun rights and mm -hmm. such, but he did also combine leftist values as well. Um, yeah, the, the Bernie Sanders coalition was very interesting. That on the one hand, it, it uh, is obviously very youth-based. Um, the younger you were virtually in every state, the more likely you were to back Sanders. It was also ideologically based the more liberal you were, self-described liberal, the, the, the likely you were. But um, it also had these other elements. I think that it failed because it failed to talk to the concerns as understood by the people who were not of the progressive wing as they understood them. Essentially, you had three primaries, in my view, last, in 2016. You had the Democratic primary, you had the Republican primary, and you had the white working class primary. The white working class primary was between Sanders and Trump. Overwhelmingly, Trump won that. That in most states, uh, particularly, uh, in most states, you either do not have party registration, so you don't, you're not barred from crossing over and voting in one primary or another, or they allow independents to move over. Uh, so in many states have a plurality of independents for that reason. Overwhelmingly, faced with Sanders' policies and the Trump policies, the white working class chose Donald Trump. 
And I think that was because what Trump spoke to them about was, it spoke to them in the degree uh, about uh, the fear of their, or uh, you offered them greater protection in a way that was less threatening to them than money Sanders did. So when I talk about a more centrist party, I'm talking about a party that would be kind of a reforming party at the center that w wouldn't necessarily take some of, you know, wouldn't necessarily adopt Medicare for all as the center of its platform and wouldn't adopt a 10% uh, personal income tax rate like Ted Cruz, uh, which is the touchstone of, of the extreme right. It would rather be something that eschewed both of them. So um, I don't view, I view Bernie Sanders as somebody who's trying to create in a modern way uh, the old, uh, there's always this sense on the left of, of a worker intellect, a farmer labor intellectual party. And I think he was doing a 21st century version of it, but failed because ultimately the values and the things that animate one part of that coalition do not appeal to him. Hi, so, um, so I've noticed that the, Dystopian society sort of offer like every older person I seem to have political discussions with like firmly believes in this as a possibility. But I've noticed that like younger people I have political discussions with don't seem to see that as really happening. Um, and but they also don't seem attracted to this idea of being a moderate. Um, they seem, uh, in fact, I've seen a lot more so like literature that's um, sort of. Uh, saying don't be a moderate because you're complicit in what this and this and that and that. And so I'm wondering, like, do you, it, like the 40% you're talking about, like, are, are young people really included in that? Um, and do we, in, you know, do we really see a future of young people that are that are going to go a moderate route? Well, uh, um, I haven't looked at the age breakdown. I think I should after what you just said. Um, yeah, I, I'll offer a couple of things. One is that uh, as long as there has been recorded history, uh, the young have been impatient. When I was young, I was in fiction. Uh, Professor Knippenberg can tell you about the relevant sections from Aristotle's politics about that. Uh, so I think some of what you see is simply that, um, which is uh, that, as Aristotle said, the old are too cautious and the young are too impetuous. And I, I don't know the Greek, so I apologize for my mistranslations. Uh, uh, whereas, you know, much as he advocated a balanced, mixed regime because it mixed the virtues of both of extremes, uh, he said, I think the same argument with age. Um, I also think among many young, particularly college educated young, uh, there tends to be a certitude of which side is right, and there tends to be a certitude of a belief in victory. So it's not a, it, if you believe that your side is right, you have that zeal, and if you do not see the costs of exercising that zeal, then you are not persuaded by the by arguments to moderate that zeal. And I think many young people exaggerate their strength and underestimate the cost. And consequently, that's one reason why you would see. But I will look at the age breakdown and see if I uh, if there is a difference because I have not looked at that, and that might help inform a change in my views. I like to give. Other people, first questions before anyone a second question. So does anyone else have a first question? Okay, you can answer a first question later, but right now you're on the floor. Um, so taking a little bit from that, why is, there seems to be an assumption that the independents of, of the nation tend to be moderates. Um, is that, is there like a lot of statistics that backs that up? Because, you know, my perspective, you know, to offer another anecdote of an instance we just had one already, is that young people who are independents tend to be either very far right or very far left, and that there's not really a lot of middle ground. That speaks again to your idea of nations, but how does that, you know, not talking about age groups, are is there it, not a far left and a far right that identifies as independents? Independents can be found all, people who self think of themselves as independents are found across the political spectrum. Be, uh, they tend to have two characters. There, there's impure independence and pure independence. Impure independence are the people who don't feel comfortable in either party, but default to voting largely for one party or another out of a lack of better options. Uh, and then you have pure independence who actually do genuinely switch both ways. The first group, um, 
tends to have more, some more heterodox ideas with their party and consequently they can't feel comfortable. And sometimes you will have the far right person who doesn't want to be a Republican because they're not far right enough for the, the far left person who feels the same way about the Democrat. Uh, they tend, though, to be more likely to be people who have some conservative views and a couple of liberal views or vice versa. And the views that they feel out of step on, they feel somewhat important about. They feel uh, are priorities. Um, and then the general person who is a straight independent, yeah, they're only a moderate because they're not exclusively on one side or the other. They don't have a self-conscious idea of moderation, uh, but rather they have a mishmash of views and don't feel at home in either party where some sense of consistency is required. Yes, sir. If we went into this election with extreme partisanship and then we elected someone who is neither a traditional Republican or a traditional Democrat, how do you see that as changing the partisan uh, divide? Well, yeah, the thing is, Trump could have been a different person. Uh, he could have chosen to try and govern as a person between the two parties. Uh, but he hasn't. He's tended to choose to be in one team, but redefining in some ways what that team stands for. You know, uh, trade, in particular, is one place where he's now uh, trying to recast the Republican Party in a more protectionist way. Um, but he could have chosen a different course, um, and that might have been the more politically advantageous course for him to do. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much.